Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Logan Pals. I am the chair of the College Republicans here at Iowa State. I want to begin by thanking you uh, for coming to the event tonight. And I hope by the end of the night, you'll be as impressed uh, by our speaker as I was the first time I got to hear him. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing, uh, you, introducing to you uh, one of the key voices of the conservative movement. Former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, uh, is a man who, devoted, who has devoted his entire life to, to, the, to our country and to the protection of our, uh, of our freedom. From an early age, he knew that understanding the past was crucial for us to succeed. See, if you do not understand the past, then you're bound to repeat it. This is why he immersed himself in the study of history. He began by getting a bachelor's degree in history from Emory University. He went on to get his master's degree and doctorate degree in modern European history from Tulane University. Speaker Gingrich was first elected to Congress in 1978. He went on to serve 10 terms in that position, culminating in the Speaker of the House. He became famous for his contract with America uh, in the 1994 midterm elections. This was the first time Republicans had taken the majority of the House in 40 years. So this was quite a feat. As, as, he's, as he was Speaker, he changed the status quo and moved the power out of Washington and back to the people. Under his power, he balanced the budget for the first time in over a generation. He uh, cut taxes for the first time in 16 years, and he increased funding to strengthen our Defense Department. Although his political career is nothing but spectacular, there's still more to Speaker Gingrich. He's the General Chairman of American Solutions for Winning the Future, which is an organization that tries to rise above the gridlock of partisan politics. He is also honorary chairman of Renewing American Leadership, which is dedicated to restoring Americans' Christian, value, Christian heritage. Him and his wife, Callista, produce and host historical documentaries, and he has published 21 novels, of which 12 have been New York Times bestsellers. My personal favorites are To Try Men's Soul, which is a historical recount of George Washington's uh, crossing of the Delaware, and Rediscovering God in America, which walks through our nation's capital and shows how important religion was to our founding fathers. He is recognized internationally as an expert on world history, military issues, and international affairs, and he serves on many boards and councils where his knowledge and expertise are displayed. Speaker Gingrich knew at an early age he wanted to dedicate his life to his country, and that he has done. He is a man that realizes the importance of, of the past and how it affects our future, so without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Wow. Thank you all very much, and thank you for that nice introduction. I must say, when you first invited me to come here, uh, I had no idea we'd have a, qu a crowd quite this size, so I'm... Uh, having to revise upward my talk. Um, I am thrilled to be here and to be back. Uh, the, although the last time I was here was a very different experience because we were uh, looking at uh, science here and we were actually looking at uh, one of the most advanced uh, computer facilities in the country. Uh, and I was in a, a cave, which is a virtual uh, reality facility that they have here that and I was actually watching a soybean plant grow. So it was sort of intriguing, but fundamentally different than this evening. Let, let me uh, talk briefly about why we write the novels. Um, Bill Fortune and Steve Hanser and I, who are the three people who work on the novels, are all professional historians by background. And we got together years ago, and we're talking about the fact that it, it, it drove us crazy that people found history boring, and, and that younger people would use, oh, that's history to mean it's dead or it's gone or it's irrelevant. Because from our standpoint, we all, we, the three of us find history to be totally alive. I mean, we're, even though we know the outcome of something, we, we read about it and we look at it and we try to understand it uh, looking forward. So I always, you know, the, in my mind, the opening day of the Battle of Gettysburg, we don't know any more than Lee does what the final outcome is going to be. And we find that, that, that for us, and I think this is true for almost all good historians, that history is about stories. It's about human beings. It's about what happens. And, it's, you know, and one of the virtues of novels is that they teach you that things have to follow logically. That is, in a novel, <clears throat> I can't be here this second and then be in Des Moines without some kind of interim moment of getting there. And so you begin to realize that you, are, that you really have to follow. You know, sometimes when you get into the social sciences, you have these vast sweeping generalizations uh, that are interesting except they have no factual basis. 
Uh, so when you talk to economists, you know, for example, right now we should have, you know, 4% unemployment if you listen to some economists, except we don't. Uh, and, and so they, their models are over here and reality is over here. And so trying to understand reality, I, I, I became a historian in part uh, because I dropped out of college for a year in 1964 and ran a congressional campaign. And I found that the experience of actually running a campaign was so much denser, there were so many more pieces to it, it was so much more complicated, that it got me intrigued with, so how does this stuff occur? And I got involved in this very fact-based model called history, where you actually go out and try to figure out what really happened. And so we began kicking around, and our first novels were all alternative histories. We, we said, what we want to do is stimulate you by saying, for example, because we want you to think about the fact that whatever actually happened didn't have to happen. It was not inevitable. And so our first series of novels, we, we started uh, actually with a little novel called 1945, which we wrote just as I became speaker, and then I got too busy to, to follow up on it. And then we came back after I left the speakership, and we wrote Gettysburg, in which we showed, with the help of the Army War College, how Lee, how Lee could have won at Gettysburg. And we designed a very accurate campaign for Gettysburg, uh, and, we, and, and we actually went out with the Army War College's team that teaches the Gettysburg campaign, and we spent time first looking at what actually happened, and then looking at what were totally realistic, plausible things that were within the range of Lee's style and Lee's approach that could have happened. And then, and then after we had Lee win Gettysburg, which made all of my friends in Georgia happy, um, we then wrote two more volumes, uh, Grant Comes East and Never Call Retreat, because our assumption wasn't that Lee winning Gettysburg meant the war was over. Our assumption was that Grant winning Vicksburg and Lee winning Gettysburg at the same time would have forced Lincoln to think differently, but he wouldn't have quit, because there's no evidence Lincoln was going to quit as long as he was alive. Then we came back, we wrote two volumes about the Pacific Campaign, uh, the first of which, again, we, we tend to use very simple, straightforward examples, is Pearl Harbor. And we ask a very simple but very important question about Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is a brilliant Japanese attack designed to fundamentally cripple the American Pacific Fleet by attacking by surprise on a Sunday morning when the fleet is anchored in, in, in uh, Honolulu. But the Japanese assigned the fleet to Admiral Nagumo, who is a cruiser admiral, who doesn't understand naval aviation, doesn't trust it, and cruisers are, are very light ships. Cruisers come in very fast and, and, and shoot, tor the Japanese model, fire torpedoes and then run like crazy. They, they don't stay around and slug it out. They're not like battleships and, and they're not like aircraft carriers. So Nagumo's instinct was to, to hit Pearl Harbor early in the morning and then run because he didn't want to risk any casualties. And we said, but what if the guys who designed the campaign, the air uh, specialists who designed the campaign, what if they had gone to um, the leading Japanese aviation specialist, who was also the head of the Imperial Navy, uh, Admiral Yamamoto, and what if they had convinced Yamamoto that he should lead the fleet? Because he understood air power, and he understood he'd been a carrier captain, and he'd been the head of naval aviation. And he was a great gambler. Uh, he, had, he had won money at Harvard playing poker, and he'd won money um, at... Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, playing roulette, and, and, and he believed in his luck. And so we designed a, a Pearl Harbor campaign in which you have Yamamoto come forward, and Yamamoto doesn't leave. I mean, Yamamoto says, wait a second, you've, you've, you've sunk the American battleships. There is no aircraft opposition left because you've destroyed it all. We, we can sail with impunity off the coast and keep pounding on Pearl. And by the way, you haven't found the aircraft carriers, so where are they? Because he would have said, it's the aircraft carriers that matter which led us to volume two, which was Days of Infamy, in which we showed a, a, an aircraft carrier battle between the Americans and, and the uh, Japanese, but happening around Pearl Harbor, not happening much later. Then we sat down and talked to our publisher. We said, you know, it's, it's been fun doing these alternative models, but we felt that America was getting in trouble and we felt that Americans were getting concerned about what did it mean to be an American. And we thought to ourselves, Maybe what we should do is focus on telling history without any changes, but telling it very vividly. And maybe we should, we should talk about what it, when, what it was like to become an American. And so our first novel was To Try Men's Souls. And 
it essentially takes George Washington at a key point in Christmas of 1776 when his army has been badly defeated. He lost starting in September at Brooklyn Height, and he himself said that the only way they survived was an, was an intervention by God because they were trapped in Brooklyn with the East River at their back. The Royal Navy was sitting in the East River. A, a large British army was coming down from Long Island to crush them. And at the last possible moment, a huge fog came in. And it was so thick that they could actually row across between Brooklyn and Manhattan and evacuate the army, and the Royal Navy couldn't see them. And so they evacuated virtually the entire army, lost a couple of thousand casualties and prisoners, but most of the army escaped. Then they lost in Manhattan, they lost in White Plains, uh, they lost in northern New Jersey, they were driven across New Jersey. By Christmas, Washington's army has dropped from 30,000 effectives in Brooklyn to 2,500, less than one out of every thousand Americans was with Washington at Christmas of 1776. This is only six months after we've signed the Declaration of Independence. And he's down to, or actually five months, he's, he's down to one out of every, less than one out of every thousand Americans. Of the 2,500 men who are available, one third do not have boots. And so they have to march with their feet wrapped in burlap bags, leaving a trail of blood. And Washington sits down with his generals and he says, look, if this army doesn't win a victory, we're going to disintegrate. And in the next three or four weeks, the entire army will be gone and the revolution will be over. And when the revolution's over, everybody in this room will be arrested and hung. So we actually don't have much at risk because if we don't succeed, we're going to die anyway. And he said, I have this plan. My plan is I'm going to take my army across the Delaware River at night in the ice during a snowstorm, march nine miles at night over a dirt road uh, to Trenton, surprise 800 professional German soldiers in the morning, and capture them. And that victory will reignite the revolution. And every one of his generals says to him, this is impossible, you can't do this. It's too risky, it's too dangerous. And he says, there is no risk, we're going to lose the war unless we do something. Now, he also believed deeply that a free people have to have moral certainty and that where your mind and spirit is is very, very important, maybe more important than physical numbers. And several weeks earlier, he had asked Thomas Paine, who was the leading pamphlet writer of his time, who had written Common Sense, which was the best explanation of the Declaration of Independence and very, very widely read. He had asked Paine, who was a rifleman in the army, to go to leave the army go to Philadelphia and write a new pamphlet. And he said to Payne, look, we've had a very, very bad fall. Everybody is demoralized. Nobody understands. We all thought it was going to be easy. We need a pamphlet which explains to us where we are. One week before Christmas, Payne publishes a new pamphlet called The Crisis, which begins, these are the times that try men's souls and that the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will have left. And now we're down only to those who truly love liberty. And that defeating tyranny like defeating hell is very hard. And it's a brilliantly written thing. It's at the back of our book. We have the opening chapters at the back. So when Washington orders his men to go down to cross the river, as they're boarding the boat, he has the officers read to each unit from Payne's new pamphlet so that they're being reminded this is the moral cause of freedom. This is what we're about. This is why we're here. They cross the river. To show you how serious they were, the password that night was victory or death. And they meant it. They crossed the river, and they marched the nine miles. They discover that instead of one ravine, there are two ravines. And what that means is they have to lower in, a, in the middle, they have this huge snowstorm, which is luckily for them coming from the north, so it's at their back. But it's an enormous snowstorm. 
and they're having to go down a ravine to cross an icy creek to go back up the other side, and then two miles later they have to go down a second ravine they didn't know existed to cross another creek to go back up the side. All of this being done in the snow by people who are relatively exhausted takes them four hours longer than they expected. By any reasonable standard, if this was a, if this was a game you were playing you know, on a computer or on a board, by any reasonable standard, the Germans would have found they were coming, organized, and destroyed them. But the Germans made a European mistake. They said, this snowstorm is so tremendous that there's no point in posting guards because no army could be out in this snowstorm. And they'd forgotten, first of all, that Americans go deer hunting in all sorts of weather. <laughs> and that for Americans, this was just a snowstorm. I mean, in Europe, city-fied people hunker down in really bad weather. In America, farmers still have to go out and take care of the cattle. It's a fundamentally different attitude towards the weather. So even though they arrive four hours late, the Germans are still basically asleep. Now, the British later claim that the Germans were drunk from Christmas Day. This is, this is patently not true. This was a professional unit. It was a unit which had been on alert several times during the night, uh, and it was a very capable unit. But the British wanted, frankly, to, to undermine Washington's achievements. They wanted to say, well, he only beat them because they were a bunch of drunks. They, they, these were actually among the best soldiers in Europe. But they had a problem. Trenton is a very small town in 1776. And it only has two streets and that, that, that go down and then has a couple cross streets. And the Americans put their cannon at the top of these two streets. And the Germans are in the buildings and in order to get organized have to come out into the street. And so now they're faced with the reality that if they try to come out in the street, the Americans will shoot them. And the whole they become totally demoralized, totally confused. People who would have fought very well if they'd gotten in, if they'd been organized suddenly disintegrate because they're so disorganized. He captures 800 German soldiers for the cost of one American. He promptly runs for the river before the British Army can catch him, takes them across the river. Many of them, by the way, ultimately become Americans and, and, and stay with us. Um, and within two weeks, because victory creates enthusiasm, he has 15,000 volunteers. He drives the British out of northern New Jersey, and the revolution has survived for the winter. Now, that's to try men's souls. A year later, Washington has been faced with a renewed British army. It has come by sea from New York down to Philadelphia. He's tried to stop it twice, once at Brandywine and once at Germantown. And both times his army has, has, has failed to execute. He, he had plans both times that might have worked, and both times the army fails to execute the plan effectively. He then has to withdraw from the Philadelphia area, leaving the biggest city in the country in the British hands. And he moves north to a place called Valley Forge, which is called that because there was an iron forge in the valley. The Continental Congress has fled west to York, Pennsylvania, which back then was a long way off by bad roads. And Washington crosses into this valley with 14,000 troops, expecting that the Congress has sent him equipment to build cabins and it has sent him food. It's done neither. When he arrives at Valley Forge for 14,000 men, he has two axes, one for every 7,000 men. And it's a sign of Washington's enormous personal strength that he calmly and methodically starts to organize a disaster. He begins to figure out how they can use the forge to make new axes. He begins to send troops out to, to requisition and buy equipment from all the surrounding farms. He begins to organize getting food in. Uh, and there are times when they're down to one day's food for the entire army. That's how close it is. He begins to bombard the Congress in, in uh, York for money, for food, and for equipment. And there are two interesting subplots. A significant part of the Congress is worried that Washington will become a dictator, and so they have decided that they will, um, uh, 
that they will not help him to see if he can fail. If he fails, then they can fire him. So he's a significant part of the Congress that's undermining him. At the same time, the number two and three generals in the American army are both trying to plot to get rid of him because they'd like to become the top general. So here's a guy in the middle of a total mess with 14,000 people he's trying to feed while he's trying to build cabins just before the winter starts, uh, while he has both the politicians on one front and two of his top officers on the other front trying to undermine him. And he just calmly stays focused. He keeps working. He's not stupid. He knows exactly what's going on. And he is methodically plotting how to outmaneuver both the generals and the politicians. And, the, and Valley Forge is the story of how Washington does three things simultaneously. How he retains control of his position by outmaneuvering General Gates and ultimately General Lee and, and the faction in the Congress that wants to fire him. How he sustains the army's morale so that he still has an army. I mean, you could imagine circumstances where the whole thing would have fallen apart. And how he, while, while doing all this, with all of these challenges, how he begins to change the army. Because what's happened is, Washington has come to realize in late 1777 that an American militia army that is not well trained will never be able to defeat the British in the open field. That if you're gonna beat the British in the open field, you have to have a very well-trained army. And so, luckily for America, Baron von Steuben arrives, a Prussian professional soldier, and he volunteers to help train the American army. And in a moment of brilliance that's truly hard to imagine, von Steuben realizes that you cannot use European training techniques for Americans. You want to get the same achievement. That is, you want a line that will stand in a disciplined way. You want people who learn how to fire their muskets in an orderly way. You want people who, who will not break under fire. But you cannot get them the way you would in Europe. Because in Europe, you have people who are involuntarily drafted into the army from the poorest parts of the community, and you basically beat them into line. And you use very harsh discipline. And it takes up to three years to create uh, a, a professional soldier. In America, if you remember, the Americans had rebelled because they wanted to be independent. And von Steuben realized almost immediately, if I try to treat these folks like European, one, they won't do it, and two, they may kill me. And so he reasons, he thinks through, and we have, we have a couple scenes that I think are just tremendous, of, of him having dinner with young officers and trying to figure out, you know, what is this American mindset and how am I going to do it? And what he figures out is, first, you've got to make it much simpler than you would have in Europe. And second, that Americans could actually learn dramatically faster. That, that when you got a volunteer who said, okay, I get it, I need to learn this, they would aggressively learn it in six weeks where it took a European three years. And so he could actually begin to imagine how he could. And what he did is he took one or two soldiers from every regiment and trained an initial unit. And when he got that one unit to work, he then sent them back to their regiments to start training the others. And in the spring of 1778, he is consistently training a first-class army. And what happens at the, at the end of the spring is they collide with the British in, in New Jersey, and they beat them. And You'll see in the battle scenes in the book, the British are totally shocked because they've always been able to beat the Americans in an open battle, and they were very confident going into it. And two things have happened that are fascinating. The first is the Americans are trained, and so they, they don't break. In fact, they're very enthusiastic because this is their chance to show the British how much they've learned. And the second is where the Americans had had a very hard winter. The British had been in Philadelphia. And life had been soft. And they were physically out of shape. Now, this is a time when people march into battle. And they're marching in woolen uniforms, carrying about 70 pounds with a musket, ammunition, equipment, clothing. And the weather's over 100 degrees. And Washington has destroyed all of the water sources. He's, he's, he's killed cattle and dropped them into the wells and into the, into the streams. The water is literally undrinkable. And here's an army which is, running, which is literally running out of fluid. 
in which they are sweating all day. And now they collide with the Americans who have plenty of water and who are in pretty good shape because they've been out in the open all winter. And the result is one of the most important victories in, in the Revolutionary War. The British never again field an army against Washington with any sense of comfort. From that point on, they stay very close to New York City uh, and, and they try to fight a campaign in the South against Washington's lieutenants, but they do not come out in the open to try to beat Washington because they conclude that, that he has, in fact, mastered warfare at the level they're talking about. Now, the war still goes on for five more years. People tend to forget. From the time of the original firing on Americans uh, at Lexington and Concord in April 19th, 1775, to the uh, peace treaty in 1783 is eight very long years. In those eight years, Washington goes home to Mount Vernon for two weeks. And Martha comes every winter to be with him. And in, in Valley Forge, two last things. Uh, Martha comes in February and stays with him until June. She both makes a real home for him. Washington gets up very early in the morning, organizes the army, does all of his work, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they have dinner. It's a social event. People, they, they invite people every day to come and have dinner with them and talk and converse. And then after the dinner lasts about two, two and a half hours. And then after dinner, Washington retires with, with the, the men uh, to, to drink port and talk for another couple of hours. And the women retire to a different room to chat. And so Washington really has a home in, Mount, in, in, in Valley Forge. And I think it's part of why he's so balanced that, that Martha plays a major role in his, in his psychological uh, stability. The, the other thing um, about it is that we found when we did the research, there were over 500 women at Valley Forge. And they were virtually all married. This was very different than the European model of camp followers. And Washington paid all of the women to work for the army. And they, they either worked in the hospitals, they worked helping cook, they worked helping clean, uh, they worked on logistics. And there were a number of children, and Washington paid the children one quarter pay to go gather firewood. So you have an entire community that is purposefully engaged in doing things during the winter of 1778. Uh, and from that, you get, the, you get the America that we now are. I draw um, two big lessons. The first is that there are times when rejection alone is not enough. And this is, frankly, my reading of the election uh, two weeks ago. We rejected the British on July 4th, 1776, when we said we're now independent. But you had to replace British combat power to make it stick. And then you had to replace a failed system of government with a constitution in 1787 to make it work. And so there are times when you have to have replacement and not just rejection. The second is that Washington is almost unimaginable. Um, he is physically big, uh, proportionate to our, to our size. If, if you had Washington today, he would be an NFL offensive tackle. He'd be about six foot nine. He was physically enormously strong. At Christmas, you can try this out. Washington could break a walnut between these two fingers. And, and when he was serving in the legislature in the House of Burgesses in, in Williamsburg, in the evenings when they would go to the tavern and sit around drinking, Governor Morris would routinely bet people not Governor Morris, I'm sorry, Governor uh, Bird of Virginia, would routinely bet people a shilling that Washington could break a walnut. And he always, he always won. And it took him a little, about 40 seconds. Uh, you can try this out at Christmas if you get walnuts, and it's very hard. Um, Washington was also, in a funny kind of way, uh, a remarkable figure. A book I want to write someday is Washington in the Wilderness when he's a young man. He is the best horseman in the colonies. And he is, starts when, when he's a teenager, he, he's working, and he goes west as a surveyor. West back then was the middle of Virginia and the middle of Pennsylvania. Um, it, it is fair to say that, that uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, was the beginning of the west when Washington was uh, in his 20s. And he was out there with the Indians. He was out there in the wilderness. Uh, he leads an expedition to uh, what becomes Pittsburgh. He actually starts the French and Indian War, uh, ends up, which is a seven-year war that spans the entire planet, uh, with campaigns in India, Europe, and the United States and the Caribbean. Uh, he ends up um, having to surrender at a place called Fort Necessity, which you can still see if you go to Pennsylvania. It's, it's not far from the turnpike. Uh, and he uh, finds himself 
uh, in a place that's not defensible, so he surrenders. He then writes a pamphlet explaining why he surrendered. Um, he um, is then asked by the British to be the senior colonial advisor to General Braddock, who shows up with the, with the British Army. And he says, he keeps trying to say to Braddock, it is not a good idea to march down the middle of a road four across in red uniforms because the French and the Indians are going to fight from behind trees and they're going to kill you. And Braddock keeps saying to him, you're obviously a colonial. You don't understand how European armies fight. Uh, and, of course, the opening volley of the ambush kills Braddock. Uh, Washington realizes there are 1,500 men in this column and they're going to be slaughtered. And Washington realizes that none of the British officers have a clue. So he takes command. Now, he's physically huge, he's on a horse, and he's reorganizing the army in the middle of a fight. And of course, everybody on the other side sees this, right? During the course of the day, while he is saving the army, he has two horses shot out from under him, and he has four bullet holes in his coat. He writes his brother that night that God clearly was watching over me. Ten years later, he runs into an Indian chieftain at a powwow. And the chieftain says to him, God clearly has something in mind for you. We were all shooting at you. <laughs> he said, I personally fired at you 13 times. And for some reason, we couldn't hit you. And that's part of this sense of Washington has of destiny and why he, there are these risks and these moments like crossing the Delaware when you just see him just move forward. And why, when he gets to, to Valley Forge, he, this is just another challenge that God has thrown his way, and it's his job to go forward one day at a time. And he, and he does this, I think, from 1775 uh, till, till he leaves the White House in 1797. He just very calmly and very methodically leads the nation for 22 years. And it's, it's, uh, he's literally the person whose shoulders we stand on. And our hope is that with Valley Forge, that will give you a sense of uh, what it was like to become an American, what it takes to be an American, uh, and what we can learn from George Washington. Let me, if it's okay, I want to toss it open for questions. Is that all right? And we have microphones. So if anybody would like to ask a question, if you'll raise your hand, one of our microphone people will come find you. Way back here in the middle. Mr. Gingrich, uh, recently I saw you with, in a meeting with David Barton and Jim Garlow, and you were talking about this last election. You called attention to our cam the campaign in Iowa, which led to the rejection of three of our state Supreme Court justices. You said we should no longer tolerate enforced secularization in our country. Now, I'm aware that David Barton has long espoused a theocracy, not a democratic republic for our nation. So do you agree with him that we should become a theocracy and be ruled by one branch of Christianity? No, I don't, I don't, I'll be glad to check with David Barton, but I don't think that's at all accurate statement about David Barton's views. I, I know Barton. I've read his stuff. Uh, and, and I can just tell you that Barton's understanding of the Founding Fathers is that they had very diverse religions, from Quakers in Pennsylvania to Catholics in, in Maryland to... Uh, a very wide range of uh, the official Church of England to Baptist. I mean, the United States was a country of enormous diversity, but it was a country which was unified in believing that our rights came from our Creator. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the key differences is whether or not you believe in American exceptionalism. And, and by that I mean the notion that uh, we have a founding political document, not a theological document, a political document. Uh, and I wrote a book about this called Rediscovering God in America. And, my wife and I made a movie about it with the same title, in which we basically point out that if you, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that's a fairly profound statement. And it means that unlike any other country in the world, Americans assert the power comes from God to each one of you personally, you are personally sovereign, and you then loan power to the state. The state does not loan power to you. And that's why we have been historically 
a dramatically different country from many of the European countries because in our system we believe that the government is limited and the citizens are the center of power. In the European model, the citizens are limited and the government is the center of power. And it's a fundamentally different model. And my only point about the, the judges here really related to judges in general. It relates to the Ninth Circuit Court in California. And it's not just about one issue. Uh, <clears throat> we have federal judges today who are routinely behaving as though they were the commander-in-chief, making national security decisions for which they're not prepared, do not have the right information, have no responsibility, and yet they're making it much harder to defend America. Uh, we have judges who make private property decisions in which they're changing the whole rule of law and deciding that, yes, the city can take away your property to sell it to a big corporation if the city wants to do it uh, under the Kelo decision. Uh, I think judges are vastly too powerful today, and I think it leads to an arrogance of power which is fundamentally wrong. Uh, and I think those people who want to change the Iowa Constitution have a technique. It's called the state legislature. Uh, but it shouldn't be judges. Judges should not be in the business of rewriting constitutions. Hello. Um, I have uh, heard you have uh, been documented saying anyone who thinks that the 9 11 tax uh, that wasn't from an enemy is insane. But I would like to remind you that there are over 1,300 architectural and engineering professionals and others who have provided substantial evidence of the use of controlled explosives in the attacks, including thermite and steel, that has still been molten for weeks after the attacks. Could I get you to please comment on that? Yeah, I don't believe it. I don't. I, I believe I believe that what you have is that the energy the energy contained in two fully loaded aircraft uh, provided a level of heat sufficiently great uh, that it caused enormous structural damage, precisely as the planners at Al Qaeda intended. Uh, that this was an attack by our enemies; it's not an inside job, and that it takes a fairly high level of belief in, in irrational. Uh, behavior to think that the United States somehow went out and secretly not only designed the destruction of one of our most important buildings, killing 3,000 people, but did so while also managing to pretend the two airplanes were hitting the building at precisely the moment the inside job blew the building up. I think that that is so extraordinarily implausible that it takes a fairly high level of paranoia to figure it out, and that's why I use the word insane. Are you going to run for president? Um, Calista and I will make that decision in February or early March. Uh, and all I can promise you is if we do uh, decide to uh, run, that we will not only go to the state of Nevada, but we'll come to the town of Nevada. Uh, and, then we'll be, <laughs> and we'll be right here in Ames, and we'll be uh, every place in Iowa. And by the way, by the way, we'll need your help. I'm told that that's all the time we have. Now, let me take two or three more questions. This is too, this is too big a group. I, I'm shocked by the size of the group. Although I will tell you, we are doing uh, uh, Hannity from somewhere here on campus, uh, I guess at 8 o'clock, right? So I guess we better one more. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. I am from Nevada. And so, <laughs> uh, but. Um, you mentioned about the bullets in Washington's uniform, and I have seen that uniform with the holes in it, and it, it, it didn't penetrate. And can you amplify that a little bit? Because I, I I'm like you are. I, I they, that when you tour, is it in Mount Vernon? It's at Mount Vernon. It's at yeah. Mount Vernon, and you look at it, and yeah. you think. I mean, I think some of them did penetrate, but but the uniform was blowing out in the wind, right? And, and he was twirling around on his horse, and they were just missing him. But yeah. you look at that uniform, you think to yourself, this is like a Houdini act. How could he possibly have yeah. survived this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'll, I'll close that. You raised a good point. If you ever get to go to Washington, block in an extra half day, and go to Mount Vernon, where they built a new. $110 million education center that is the finest introduction to George and Martha Washington ever developed, and you will find yourself and your family enthralled, and it is a wonderful, wonderful facility, and I recommend it very, very highly. And I guess you better go over to the bookstore or something because I am told of, I don't have much time to have to go do Hannity. Thank you all very, very much.
Thank you all for coming again. Uh, Speaker of the House Gingrich will be in the back signing books, so if we can form a line, uh, we'll get through as many as we can. Thank you.